what's the worst that could happen? Have you ever found yourself saying that to someone when you're trying to convince them to do something? But I don't think I want to eat the raw sea slug. Come on, what's the worst that could happen? You don't really worry about that worst if you don't think it's going to happen. And if it does, well, you've always recovered from it in the past. That kind of thinking has worked out okay for us so far. But now, with six billion people and technology that might be able to change the planet, it's conceivable that there may be some worse that we can't recover from. Take global warming, for example. If you listen to the worst predictions, we may be in for a nasty future with storms, droughts, floods, epidemics, famine. But what if that worst isn't going to happen? What if it's not true? Or that we're not the ones doing it? it? Seems like a pretty important question to figure out, what with the fate of the human race and all. Which is probably why there's still some bitter fighting going on about it right now. What if I told you I think I've found an argument that makes that whole bitter question of whether it's really happening or not moot? An argument where we don't need to know whether it's true or not in order to still decide what to do or not do. An argument that leads to a conclusion that even the most hardened skeptic and the most panicked activist both can agree on. Sounds impossible, doesn't it? Well, it seems like it to me, too. Which is why I'm putting this argument out there, to check to see if my reasoning is delusional. Because, frankly, no one I've shown it to so far has been able to poke a hole in it. And it leads to a conclusion I find inescapable and terrifying. So, here it is. When faced with uncertainty like we are with climate change, it becomes useful to look at the different possibilities for the future in order to be able to compare them side by side. So, one of the first things to look at is whether human-caused global climate change is real or not. There are two basic possibilities, one that it turns out to be false and one that it turns out to be true. Now, this is a key point because this is where we get to set aside that whole contentious debate about whether the globe is warming and we're the ones doing it. We do that by acknowledging that no one can know with absolute certainty what the physical world will do. All reasonable people should be able to admit to the possibility that they might have a mistaken understanding about reality. So, at this point, we all agree these are both possibilities. The second thing to look at is what action on climate change do we take? Let's make column A yes for significant action and column B no for little to no significant action. What that gives us is a grid with four boxes, each box representing a basic scenario for the future. Let's take a look at what each of those futures might look like. The first is the future where we did take action on climate change, but climate change turned out to not be true, not be real. So what would the consequence of that be? Well, wasted money mostly. This is what the skeptics are warning us about. Increased taxation, burdensome regulation, bloated government. Now, for the purposes of contrast, let's take this to the extreme. Let's say we end up with massive layoffs caused by draconian regulation, which sparks a recession, which spirals into a depression, which cascades worldwide, and we end up with a global economic depression, which makes the 1930s look like a cakewalk. Okay, how about this scenario where we didn't take action, and we didn't need to, so we made the right decision. No big economic consequences, continued prosperity. I'm sure we had some problems, but climate change wasn't one of them. How about this scenario, where we did take action on climate change, and it's a good thing, too, because the doomsayers turned out to be right. Well, we still got the cost associated with that, but in this case, it was money well spent, because the money and the regulation allowed us to counteract climate change. It still happened, but we managed it. It's a different world, but it's livable. Now, how about this scenario over here, where the doomsayers turned out to be right and we didn't take action? Now, since we granted the extreme up here, we should grant the extreme down here. And in that case, it gets kind of ugly because we've got an economic, political, social, environmental, and public health catastrophes on a global scale. This is your worst case scenario. This is the sea level rising 10, 20 feet, entire coastal countries disappearing, hundreds of millions of people worldwide displaced, crowding in on their neighbors, causing widespread warfare over scarce resources and long-standing hatreds. We've got entire forests die and burn, massive droughts alternating with catastrophic floods. We've got the, the uh, breadbaskets of the USA and Russia turned to dust bowls causing catastrophic famines, terrible disease epidemics, spreading like wildfire, hurricanes like Katrina becoming the norm. I mean, this is a world straight out of science fiction. Economic collapse because the global economy has been hit by crisis after crisis. This is a world that makes Al Gore look like a sissy Pollyanna with no guts who sugarcoated uh, the bad news. Okay, so we've simplified things here a little bit. The clue should be the smiley faces. Any diagram of smiley faces certainly has some complexities underneath. 
and do this yourself. Add the complexities back in. Use pencil and paper and put some odds in here. Use the, uh, play with the mild cases, not just the extreme cases on both sides. Put in some intermediates in between these dichotomies. And I think you'll see that the following argument still arrives at the same inescapable conclusion. So here's the argument. You can think of it in terms of row thinking versus column thinking. Our future <coughs> will fall roughly in one of these four boxes. Now, because climate change may or may not be real, we cannot know for certain which row the future will lie in. What we can know for certain, because we control it, is which column the future will lie in. So it's a bit like buying a lottery ticket. You buy lottery ticket A or ticket B, and then you sit back and wait to see what the laws of physics deal out as a result on your ticket. So let's say we pick lottery ticket A. At that point, we're determining that our future lies somewhere between a global economic depression and a different but livable world. So here's a scenario where we made a mistake. We acted when we didn't need to. And here's the cost of that mistake, a global economic depression. This is the risk associated with buying lottery ticket A. Well, that sounds like a pretty scary risk, so let's see if we have a better option over here on lottery ticket B. If we pick column B, and it turns out to be the right choice, then hey presto, we're happy. And if it turns out to be a mistake, what would the cost of that mistake be? The end of the world? Well, the end of the world as we know it. The globe will still be here. Humans will still be here. The species will survive. But this is a very different, much more hostile place. This is the risk associated with picking column B, whether by deliberate choice or, and here's the scary part, by default of inaction because we were busy debating, trying to guess which row the future would land in. Notice that this cost down here, this consequent, incorporates the threat to the economy that this one up here does, but with some added bonus features as well. Also, it gets worse than that because in the last five years, we've learned that it's possible, it's plausible, that this might happen abruptly in a very short time period, perhaps as short as a decade or two. So we're not just talking abstract grandchildren here, we're talking you and me. Now, don't take my word for it on this. Don't take anyone's word for it. Do this to yourself. Listen to information on climate change and when you hear it, ask yourself, are they talking about guessing at rows or are they talking about choosing between columns? Because I think you'll see that however you construct this, the argument still leads to the same inescapable conclusion which is this. When faced with uncertainty about our future, the only responsible choice, the only defensible choice, really the only choice is column A in order to eliminate this as a possibility. Because the risk of not acting far outweighs the risk of acting. So, there's my silver bullet argument. So what do you personally do about it? Well, here's some good news for a change. In fact, it sounds too good to be true because it's stunningly easy. What you do is spread the word. Because the only way we truly get into column A is changes in public policy. And those only change when enough people demand it. So you do what you can to spread an understanding of this argument and to increase public demand for column A. You make this part of your thinking, part of your conversations. And you forward this video on to others so it changes their thinking. And then they forward it to others and they forward it to still others. Imagine that. Because in today's information age, you can change the culture. You can help change public policy. And remarkably, sometimes just a few mouse clicks is all it takes to start an avalanche. So I'm asking you, whom I've never met, but whose fate I'm still tied to, if you think I'm wrong, please tell me where, politely. And if you can't find an error in my reasoning or my assumptions, and help spread the word, talk about this, forward it to others. Because anything less, and intentionally or not, we're choosing column B. Why does that terrify me? Because we only get to play this game once. Think it won't happen? Maybe. How lucky do you feel?